Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. I'm so excited to be here. So much show. I showed up yesterday, <laughs> <laughs> anticipating that it was a presentation. And I've had this date on my calendar for a while, but that's how, ex how excited I am to be here. So thanks for joining me in this um, conversation around a topic that's really important to me. And overall, my goal is to be a resource to everyone that's in the room and to create a safe space for us to have some conversation that can move along the work in your schools and your home life around supporting African-American students. So to begin, the title of my presentation, as you know, is African-American Engagement in Primary and Secondary Education, Examining the Relationship Between the Student and the Learning Environment. And this is the work that I do out of my company that I founded in 2018. Birds Equity and Inclusion Solutions. So I want to give you an overview of how we'll spend our time. So I like to structure my presentations like I structure my classroom. So we'll have a lot of work to um, get done here, but there's two parts to this workshop. The first part is really just to foreground this conversation that we're going to have. So um, some things that I'll highlight, a bulk of my lecturing for this part of the workshop will happen between 9.55 and 10.30. And you'll have a quick break, and then for the second part, um, you'll join by doing another working group session, work, wrestling with some topics that I'll present to you, and then I'll do some more lecturing and education around this particular topic. Our goals for this workshop session, to address the complexities inherent in being black in classrooms, to teach techniques and strategies for supporting educators in building meaningful and authentic relationships with black children. And the last goal is to practice having honest, objective, and supportive conversations to become better advocates for African American students. So as educators, practitioners, parents, community members, it's important that we have these type of conversations. And I want to provide some tools on how to create a space for these conversations to happen. So along those lines, um, I want to just set some norms for the conversations that we'll have today. Uh, the first norm, and we'll have time to practice this, is to greet others genuinely and make an effort to pronounce their name accurately. We want to do this as adults because it's the same type of relationship that we would want to foster with our children and their parents. Um, be present. So being present for me, um, if you want to, I want, would like everyone to put away the computer and the cell phone as well, um, because we do a lot of sharing in this space, and I just want to make sure that everyone's engaged and focused. Um, listen to understand versus listen to respond. You might hear some new ideas or some perspectives that you haven't heard of before. And the idea behind listening to understand versus listen to respond is this, this the concept that you want to be an active listener, and sometimes being an active listener means that you don't need a ready response. It's just creating a space for a person to be heard around a topic that's really important. Accept the speaker's viewpoint as true for him or her. Uh, I really want to empower everyone to use I statements in this space. So if you have experience with African American students, you name that. If you are teaching, raising, so forth. But I want to invite you to speak to situations that you've been a part of and not feel that this is a space where you speak for others who aren't in the room, particularly your colleagues or your supervisors or other teachers that you're around. This is really for you to gain as much as you can, but it's also to create a space where you can have a fruitful conversation and make sure your needs are being met. Uh, lean into discomfort. Give space and grace and be willing to have the tough, candid, and caring conversations. Just we don't know what could come out of this space today, but I ensure you that it will be beneficial for all of us in here. And accept working through conflict to its resolution as a catalyst for learning. So these are norms that you could use in any meaning that you'll have around um, professional development. This is an image from where I grew up on East Bay Shore Road in Clark in East Palo Alto, California. I was born in 1986 um, to my mother and my father. My mom was 18 years old when she had me. And um, I grew up in a gated community, low income public housing. And a majority of my experiences around education, working with others, come understanding my identity as a person, as a black student, came in this uh, apartment complex. So I wanted to start there. I was a type of student that my teachers identify early on as gifted. And so they identified me as being gifted and many of the teachers in the schools that I attended in the Ravenswood City School District, they had to contend with 
What do you do with a child that's gifted in this environment? What do you do with the other um, small group of students that are gifted given the experiences that other students were having? So the experiences that come with living in a low-income neighborhood were um, teenage pregnancy, sometimes disruption in the classroom, fights and all of those type of things. So the school district was really trying to figure out what do we do with these students who have the potential to thrive in their life? We don't want to lose them. We have to do something to foster a learning environment that's safe for them. So all that to say, kindergarten through fourth grade, I attended Brentwood Academy, which was not even a mile from my house. So I had the experience that was communal. I walked to school with people from my co apartment complex. I knew the cross guard lady. I knew everyone that was on that street. It really was a, a positive time in my upbringing. But when I reached fifth grade, I crossed the, um, the fence, which was another school, Edison McNair, which is Ronald McNair Academy. And I lasted in that school for a month until the principal decided to pull all the gifted students out of the class and create an experiential learning around um, a, a magnet education or like a higher quality education, if you will. So I ended up being bused to the district office. So there were about 17 of us from that particular school. We were pulled from different classes and we started to have our education at a district office in a portable where teachers would come and teach us. And we were told, you're gifted, we wanna keep you on track. They challenged us academically. From the experience of being a young person, I did feel challenged academically and I felt that I was able to concentrate better. So I benefited from that smaller space and I benefited from having some academic rigor. That experience led me to another school within the Ravenswood City School District, which was Green Oaks Academy, which led me to another school within the Ravenswood City School District, which was Menlo School. And that's where I started my middle school experience. Um, middle school there was an amazing experience for me. I was very fortunate because in that space, I did have teachers that looked like me, that were African American, that saw me, that helped me, that promoted my um, healthy racial identity development, as well as my academic development. And I also had teachers that weren't black that similarly really supported me and made me feel encouraged and motivated as an academic learner. So I share that experience because the work that I do comes from my personal background of being black as a student in school and trying to make the most out of my living environment. When I was a seventh grader at Menlo Oaks Academy, I had a Jewish teacher and I mentioned the fact that she's Jewish because that was a major part of her identity. And we were in social studies. She taught us about the Holocaust. She was very confident in who she was as an individual. And I really gravitated toward her because I also felt comfortable in my own skin. She encouraged me to think about applying to attend a private school just to continue with the idea of a smaller classroom and so forth. So that's how I ended up at the Menlo School. So I went from being in culturally rich environments where there were many teachers of color to go into an environment that was predominantly white where I was the only African-American student in my class for several years. So I experienced complete culture shock. So my journey to receiving an education from being a young student in kindergarten to being in a gifted program to going into a, um, a private institution taught me the glaring inequalities that persist here in California when it comes to the education that students receive. It's very drastic depending on what your zip code is, depending on where you live, and just where you're situated in based on where your home address is. So I saw the, the, I saw the qualities in a public education, and I saw the qualities in a, a private education, and I also saw the challenges. And those challenges have always stuck with me. And I lead off of those challenges, and I want to be an advocate and a resource for, for students and their families because of the challenges that I endure. So briefly, I'll just share what some of those challenges consisted of for me at a very young age. I went from having a lot of racial pride in my background. I went from being talkative, motivated, always a student in public school to raise my hand, to speak up and do all of those things. But because my context shifted for me and I didn't see people that looked like me and there wasn't representation, I became isolated. And I became, um, I still stayed connected and went to class but I started to change into an individual that I didn't recognize. And teachers recognized, they saw that in me in school. And a lot of that had to do with, I was exposed to racial stereotypes for the first time. Um, I was exposed to insults about my background, examples that I remember being very young, 14, is hearing people say, if you walk outside of your door, are you gonna get shot? 
they had a, some of my classmates had a kind of negative connotation about where I grew up in East Palo Alto. So it really just triggered a lot of emotions in me that um, still made me feel motivated, but just challenged me to think about like, wow, who am I? Why is everyone so concerned about me being black? Because that's something in a sense that I took for granted because it was always so positive up until that point. But as you imagine, any child that you've worked with, when the social environment isn't as great as it needs to be, it does take a toll on a student emotionally, which has an impact on academics. So I was trying to manage the social part of it, but I was also trying to stay on top of my academics. So those two combined made it very challenging for me. So I like to share with that story because I found myself from that point on wanting to be involved in social justice work and diversity work. From starting a BSU on that school campus to becoming involved in the Gay Straight Alliance Club, to join in La the Latinos Unidos Club, to really rally, rallying behind other people who felt other or different and wanting to be an ally. I continued with that work in 2004. When I graduated from high school, I went to Lake Forest College in Illinois and um, I was exposed to cultural groups on that campus as well. And by the first month, I became the president of the United Black Association. And I was in a situation where I could help students who were grappling and dealing with other issues that I was going through. Follow that work, went to Illinois, in, uh, went to school in Illinois, and I came back to California. And my first job out of college was working for the College Track Program in East Palo Alto, which is a college access program for students who need support financially, socially, um, they provide mentorships, tutoring, summer opportunities, amazing experiences. So I worked for that organization and I worked with students who were in the majority Sequoia Unified School District, so Menlo Atherton, Carmont High School, um, Woodside High School and so forth. And I still started to see those same challenges that um, I dealt with as an individual. So that motivated me to continue with my education after two years, and I ended up going to Stanford University Graduate School of Education, and my focus at the time was about access, and my internship there was working for an organization called Citizen Schools, which is an extended day program on middle school public school campuses that expand the learning day for students. So rather than students being dismissed at three o'clock, they're dismissed at five because they have apprenticeships with employees from Facebook, Google, they have extra math classes, they have extra English classes. So I continue with that. And then after a year and a half working there, I ended up back at Menlo School in the role as a director of diversity and inclusion. And I was really charged with changing the school institutionally to make it an inclusive place. So I spearheaded a diversity committee. Um, I led a five-year diversity strategic plan and that's really where I gained my understanding of what it truly means to create a culture shift in an environment to where people are changing or shifting their consciousness to be able to reach students who are coming from different backgrounds than their own. And so I like to lead with that story and that work because it's something that's important to me and that's why I'm, I'm here today. So I wanna start with this, um, this expression is um, Kasarian in Gera. And I actually gave you that handout there. And I started reading this book here by Dr. Joy DeGroy, and it's called Post Traumatic Slave Syndrome American's Legacy of Enduring Injury and Healing. It's a really good book, and I'm enjoying it. And I came across um, a story in here that relates to this topic, so I wanted to share and read it. So, that, ex that saying, Kasarian injera, is actually a Swahili expression for, and how are the children? So I wanna read this excerpt from her book, and the handout, if you wanna read along, is on the last page of your packet. Among the most accomplished and fabled tribes in Africa, no tribe was considered to have warriors more fearsome or more intelligent than the mighty Maasai. That's the image here. It is perhaps surprising then to learn the traditional greeting that passed between Maasai warriors, Kasarian and Jira. One would always say to another, it means and how are the children. It is still the traditional greeting among the Maasai, acknowledging the high value that the Maasai always place on children's well-being. Even warriors with no children of their own would give the traditional answer. All the children are well. 
meaning that peace and safety prevail, the priorities of protecting the young and the powerless are in place, that Maasai society has not forgotten its reason for being, its proper functions and responsibilities, all the children are well, means that life is good. It means that the daily struggles of existence, even among a poor people, do not preclude proper caring for its young. I wonder how it might affect our consciousness of our children's welfare if in our country we took to greeting each other this same daily question, and how are the children? I wonder if we heard that question and pass it along to each other a dozen times a day, if it will begin to make a difference in the reality of how children are thought of or cared for in this country. I wonder if we could try, if we could truly say without any hesitation, the children are well. Yes, the children are well. So this was actually experted from a speech by Dr. by Reverend Dr. Patrick T. O'Neill. And this is a speech that he gave at the First Parish Unitarian Universalist Church. So I wanted to start with that because I believe that's why we're here. How are the children? So to start, I want to create an opportunity for us to get to know who's in the room. So I want us to spend five minutes just going around the room and sharing um, what is your name. We'll do it as a large group since it's a smaller group. Um, your school position or role or affiliation with Santa Clara Office of Education. In other words, how did you end up here today? I want you to think about why are you here and what do you hope to walk away with this afternoon? And then we'll transition to answering that question for ourselves. In our context and where we come from, how are the African American children and students doing? So is there anyone that would like to get us started? We're just gonna go around the room with introductions. Thank you. Sure. Um, uh, hi, I'm, sorry, if you could tell me. I am Jean Wallace. Um, I am a vice president of board of directors for the, the outdoor schools. I'm on the coast called Sporting New Horizons. Um, we have three campuses, and they've been going for 40 years. So I'm hoping to keep them going for 40 more years. Um, but uh, but the, the students, we, the population of students we have um, could be more diverse, more of an inclusive group there. Um, and we're, we're between Santa Cruz County and Santa Clara County, so that's kind of the um, dissection of where we are. Um, I'm here today to represent my, my, my um, organization and to see how we can, as an organization, engage more with, with you, with folks here, um, to address these concerns for students who are um, usually here and want to be, and we want to teach them environmental education on the coast. We think people will you know, close to the water and stuff. Um, and I hope what I want to walk out with today is just ways, ways to make it all better. So I don't know. I don't know what I'm going to walk out here yet. <laughs> Thank you. Anyone else? What direction? Let's go on this side here and we'll work our way around. Okay. My name is Michelle Hicks. I'm here as a parent. Um, I have two children in the Cupertino Unified School District. Um, so we know how diverse or non diverse that school district may or may not be. Um, and so I have one in middle school and then I have one in elementary school. So when I heard about this conference, I wanted to be able to come. Um, collaborate with others and take that back to my schools. I've been PTA president at the elementary school, involved in both, and so being able to take it back to our educators and say, hey, this is what I've learned. How can we implement that into our schools? Just some of the conversations, in fact, I was at um, one of the parent coffees yesterday, and just some of the conversations that we have at home that I then share with the administration, they're looking like, oh, that happened? I'm like, yes. That did, that was just a regular Wednesday. <laughs> and, and that's what my child heard, but that's what my child experienced. So I want to be able to um, walk away today with information that I can take back to them, that they can then learn from and stand upon as well. Thank you. Good morning, I'm Sung Park. I am coordinator in the Inclusion Collaborative um, in the Santa Clara County Office of Ed. And I'm here today because I'd love to uh, collaborate and. Uh, talk and hopefully uh, come to great uh, solutions or ways to improve so that our children are well or better. Um, and this is uh, absolutely right that uh, we thought about everything and you know, how our, our children you know, and lead off of that, uh, that would be a wonderful place for us to be. I'm Barbara Campbell, Director of Academic Services in Allen Rock School District. And I'm here today, one, um, just try, you know, 
looking at the different opportunities in California, one including grant offers, but the other one is to be able to walk away with just some some ideas in order to um, you know make our schools more inclusive environments, more environments where everybody feels welcome and everybody accepts everybody. Mm -hmm. So just really looking at at that perspective in relation to all our students. My name is Amy Almazon, and I'm the coordinator for state and federal programs um, at the Allen Rock Union School District with the FARB, um, we're in the same district. And uh, I'm here today because I, I really want to deepen my understanding of our African American students mm -hmm. and you know how how they may be you know feeling and, and thinking as they navigate through you know education, let alone life. Right, and um, what I hope to walk away with um, with you all today is um, really also having an understanding of what they go through on a day-to-day -day basis because I want to understand that. You talk about you know at a very young age you knew what you know racial stereotypes were at a very young age, and um, I worked. I worked in, prior to this role, I worked as a principal mm -hmm. in my district, and in that time that I was a principal, it was all in middle school. Mm -hmm. And I always had conversations with my African American students about, you know, if I'm, if I'm too smart, you know, I get, I get criticized for that, being too white. And if I'm not, if I'm being loud, right, I get in trouble. So those are the kinds of things that you know, I want to deepen, continue to deepen my knowledge so that I can also share that with my colleagues who are still at the sites so that they can create those inclusive environments, that they can create a space for you know, our, our black and African American students you know, to thrive and, you know, and, and know and how to deal with, with these you know, environmental stressors, if you will. I'm here to, to learn and really to deepen my understanding. It's a life, equity is a lifelong process and it's some, there's always something that to learn, um, self-examination, reflection um, about different types of folks um, and about myself, you know, in particular. And, um, and that's why I'm really here today and to, you know, build my skill level, my repertoire of uh, things that I can, I can use and develop to help others on that journey. And I'm Sherry Palladino. I'm an inclusion training specialist here. And um, I'm also here to learn and to just, just, um, just open my mind to different, um, different, different things, new, new things that I don't know. So, thank you. Myra, introduce yourself. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Myra. I am an inclusion services specialist with the Inclusion Collaborative. Um, and I am involved with the California One Grant um, that focus, one of the focus student groups is African Americans, uh, African American students. Um, so I'm really just here to um, learn more. I'm not involved with a lot of the actual hands-on work that goes on with students, um, but I am involved in more of the background. Um, so any knowledge is good knowledge, and I'm, I'm here to just learn more um, in general and to see how I can then use that as a resource for other people by, you know, <coughs> with either including you in our conference and, you know, making that resource open to more people. Thank you. Hi. Okay. My name is Kelly. I'm a manager in the Inclusion Collaborative. We're well represented today. <laughs> um, I'm here to do right by the kiddos that we serve. Um, and then my hope for today um, as one of the contributors to the Waste Equity Playbook is to make sure that we are lifting up the voice that needs to be lifted and doing it correctly and respectfully. Thank you. Hi, good morning. I'm Linda Cochran and I'm also out of the Santa Clara County Office of Education, but my contract is a state contract for the California, from the California Department of Education, Early Learning and Services Division, and I teach teachers. I do professional development for preschool teachers around the foundations and the frameworks. Um, I am here 
for a lot of reasons, but the state is currently, I'm, I'm not sure if everybody's aware, currently working on a document about the high suspension rates of, of boys of color. Um, so we are going to be training on this very sensitive uh, issue. It's also been my personal experience. We also do on-site GTA coaching that when I get called out for challenging behaviors, they're almost often boys of color. So I've not only read about the research, but I have experienced it personally. So I'm, you're never too old to learn. I'm on close to retirement, but um, I'm going to get as much as I can so that I can take it with me into the community when I have time to volunteer. Wonderful. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Roberto Munez. I'm Director of Leadership Development at Monterey County Office of Ed. And um, this, at the be in August of this, the beginning of this school year, um, two superintendents of our county, uh, pro, uh, my boss, uh, county superintendent, um, for assistance because in their two districts, um, the uh, the scholar group that is having the most difficulty in achievement is our African American groups and. And it's a small population because in our county, the majority of our students are Latinx. So, um, uh, so she tasked me with um, a project to uh, start an African American scholar leadership forum. And so we started in December, and uh, we set it up with uh, with a keynote speaker from Christian uh, Page. He's a if you haven't heard that young man speak, Christian Page is phenomenal. He's out of Washington, Seattle. But um, he, uh, he really set the stage for us uh, on our first meeting. And then we set up um, three rounds of workshops. Uh, but the main gist of our task was to interview each student uh, with empathy interviews because mm -hmm. we feel that it's very important to get student voice. They're the ones that are going through the lack of successful experience. Um, and let's just be honest. Um, American schooling wasn't created for students of color, so um, it, it, we're still operating in a system that is such. And so getting their voice, we want to empower them. So we had Christian uh, work with them on speaking their truth, but speaking truth to power. And, uh, and after we Prime the pump, if you will, and then we set the empathy interviews. Mm -hmm. And we just finished transcribing all that information. So we're meeting with them again on the 21st. And then, long story short, all this work, um, we're trying to uh, just build this coalition of, of student leaders, scholar leaders, we call them scholars, um, so that we could uh, then on in May, on May 6th, we're inviting uh, Dr. Nadine Burke, um, the Surgeon General, to come and facilitate our community panel. And that's where we're going to uh, share all the transcribed information that we gleaned from our scholars and see how the community, so we're trying to create this grassroots um, synergy, if you will, to change the trajectory and hopefully uh, empower our administrators and our teachers especially um, on how to check their biases at the door when they come in and uh, put put their students um, lives in front of, of their impressions first if you will so that's the goal when I heard uh, when I was forwarded this information of course I had to be here today because this is the work that we're doing so Anyway, I just hope to make a good connection and uh, see how we can mobilize the whole village, right? Thank you. Can I just ask that you send us that invitation? To the community? To Dr. Nadine Burks, so we oh, can yeah. see what, what, you know, what you're doing? Yeah, it's going to be and a community panel. We have a... Uh, awesome. We actually have a... And we're going to do it in our studio so it can fit about 100 people, so yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'll just, I don't know who's in charge of uh, yeah, is, yeah. the, she is. but just, you send me the email with the list. <laughs> I will. I'm going to get your card before you leave. Thank you all for the introductions. I hope everyone's feeling warmed up. Now you know who's in the room. 
I do want to do in a, uh, um, a deep dive more into, yes. So in unpacking that question, how are the children? I have some questions that I want you all to address in your small groups. The first question is, how are the African American students in Santa Clara County Office of Education, your child's school, or where you teach and lead? Are they well, why or why not? That's the overarching question there. Then I want to do a, a, take a deeper look at, are there obstacles preventing African American students from being engaged in the classroom or feeling welcome in the school environment? And lastly, what do you believe students need in order to feel connected? So to help, I suggest that you just number it one, two, three, and then jot down your responses and your ideas that way. Yeah. With a razor sharp focus, then that for me, this right here is the context of it is important for me to know too. Because again, there was seven because we all we do have kids that are also on the coast. What I'm going to do is post the feedback around the room so you'll have time to um, take a look. Here, I'll take it here. Um, take a look at it. But what I want to do is a brief share out. And the question that I'm going to focus on is question number two from the different groups. And what I want is an example. So you might have come up with different examples around obstacles preventing African American students from being engaged or feeling welcome. You will have time to see the feedback that everyone jotted down during break, but I do want to create the space for people to do a share out. I use the phone and I'm all about timer. So I'm gonna give each group a minute just to share What's an obstacle or two that your group is, that African American students are facing in the different contexts that you talked about? So I want to start with this group here. Is that me? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, really? right, right. Number one. Uh, oh, my gosh. What do I have to spend on? Well, number one, I think that we just talked about not, not the example, but the concept and the example. Um, we were basically talking how. Uh, if the obstacle isn't seen by others, they are not even going to be able to engage or assist at all. Because it's like seeing a gauntlet. Like, I don't see a gauntlet, so what's the problem? And that's kind of what the experience was, is that they're, they're not even seeing the obstacle even exists. Um, back, back to our thing of being non-existent and awareness. Um, but for example, we were talking about, I think one example here was, was your parent. So we're talking about um, her, her son's examples um, in school. Um, and that they were having like a conversation where he said, got a meeting, and it was like a rainbow Wednesday. Like, it's the one. Do you want to speak about that example? It's just like a, it was pretty, it's your son's example, so I can't spare your son's yeah, example. Yeah, yeah, no. Okay. Um, so, feeling welcome, or, and I shared a lot of examples. So, I'm gonna, I'm gonna piggyback really quick, though, to my daughter, who is 10, and feeling welcome in school. Um, we just know we've just had Black History Month, all that good stuff. So yes, hey, Chloe. It. Hey, Chloe, go ask your teacher what are you guys going to do for Black History Month? So she comes home and her all of her 10 year old self and says, My teacher said she thought that was last month. Oh, wow. So you tell me, do you feel welcome in your school mm -hmm. when that's the response? So I think that's, there's your. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's your yeah, I have a few, I have a few of them. So here I'm all dead. But, yeah, that, that is the one that. Yeah. Yeah, so in that example, it's just there not, it wasn't even like an obstacle to be seen. Mm -hmm. It's not like, oh my god, you're right, blah, blah, blah. It's just it's nothing. Non existent. Yeah, that's, that's, that's not existent. Yeah. Thank you for that example. And we could talk, uh, unpack that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> this middle group here. Uh, we we talked a lot of a number of obstacles that we could practically like use up that whole entire easel pad. Um, but one of the things that I had. Um, shared with, with the group is the fact that um, these this past month, um, I traveled to different middle schools because we're doing our LCAP you know, input sessions and whatnot. And one of the main things that the kids really, really wanted to put out there was the fact that I wish the teachers and or the adults in the building knew me better. Mm -hmm. So kind of connecting and building off mm -hmm. of you know the experiences here of you know, Chloe being invisible. Now, again, kids being invisible because the adults in the building don't know them well enough or hear, or hear them well enough. Thank you for that. 
We it's can good. piggyback off of that invisibility as well. We talked a little bit about, well, not a little bit, a lot about how um, Santa Clara County as a whole, not necessarily the off this office building, but the county as a whole, um, the, the minorities that are lifted up are the Latinx and the Asians. So that being said, when you have a minority within those minorities, they're, they're marginalized even more. They become even more invisible. And with that, the adults that are supposed to be advocating on their behalf don't have the preparedness to uplift them and, and be an advocate for them. Thank you. Thank you for those examples. We're going to come back to that, but I wanted to just like have you check where you're feeling. So after reflecting on these questions, think about how you will engage with the topics being discussed this morning. So do you feel like you're at a green, you're ready to go, keep going? Um, you're yellow, I can go on, but I feel hesitant about moving forward. Or red, I do not want to go on right now. Hopefully you all are green, you're ready to keep going. <laughs> okay. So I wanted to get into the education that will touch on some of what just came up. So when we talk about the experiences of African-American students, it's important to acknowledge the research that is out there and scholars who are already doing the work and who have done the work. So I'll highlight three books that are important to me that I've read that help me as a practitioner, as an educator. So the three books that I want to highlight is um, Dr. Beverly Daniel Tatum's book, Why Are All the Black Kids Sitting Together in the Cafeteria and Other Important Conversations About Race, um, The Dream Keeper, Successful Teachers of African American Children by Gloria Latsing Billings and Other People's Children, Culture, Conflict in the Classroom by Lisa Delpit. We could imagine what it would be to support African American students to make sure that they excel, but there's a lot of good work that's already been tapped into that we could learn from, and I wanted to start our conversation around the education piece with the work that scholars have done before me and then also some work that I did through my research as well. So let's start here. So this comes from um, Gloria Latson's book and it's about this concept of culturally relevant pedagogy. So you all have probably heard this idea before of a teacher in the classroom or as educators, how do you make the work and the materials relevant so that students could see themselves reflected and what they're learning, but also that you tap into and access, access those dimensions of them around their race that make them feel bright, that make them feel like scholars, that make them feel exception, exceptional, but also that make them feel like they belong in, this, in, in the schools that they're in. So she argues that students must experience academic success. Culturally relevant pedagogy, you could come up with great examples, but how does that correlate into students, do, students doing well and performing well academically? That's her first argument. Her second argument is that students must develop and or maintain cultural competence. You can know about yourselves, but part of being an individual and being just keen on working with people in humanity is that you also have to have an awareness of people around you in your environment, the cultures of others, and connect with people cross-culturally. How do you talk to someone of a different race? How do you connect with an individual that comes from a different background that's just as important as a person having content that's relevant that makes them perform academically? She also argues that students must develop a critical conscience, consciousness in which they challenge the status quo of the social current order. We want to teach students to be critical thinkers. So it's, if, if they're reading content or if you're introducing them to literature or if you're introducing, introducing them to concepts, how do we prepare them to be able to say, this is true for my reality or this isn't true or why are things this way? What more can I learn? We want them to just push the teachers and be able to feel empowered to dig and dive deeper into the lessons and what they're learning. So it's not just enough to present them with content that's reflective of their culture, is training them and motivating them to be critical and even open to new ideas and interrogating work. So if the expectation is that one of the ways in which students could perform well academically or have an opportunity to feel a sense of belonging in the classroom is that they're presented with this culturally relevant 
pedagogy, then it does put emphasis and onuses on the who's in charge of the learning environment. So what does that mean for teachers? If teachers are the ones that students are encountering every day to carry out this type of work. So similarly, she gets into teachers with culturally relevant practices. What does it mean for a teacher to be able to do this well? So there are some points that she talked about that I will go over. She says that teachers who are able to provide this type of learning environment for students have high self-esteem and a high regard for others. They feel, comp they feel capable of doing it. They feel good about their teaching. They feel supported. All of those type of factors contribute to their ability to be able to introduce work that's relevant to the student's background. She also says they see themselves as a part of the community, see teaching as giving back to the community and encourage their students to do the same. So they're a part of a larger purpose and they, and they recognize that. She also argues that teachers see teaching as an art and themselves as artists. You're always growing, you're always developing, you're always reimagining. How do you teach content that you've been teaching for 20 years? Or for some people that have been teaching it for five years? How do you revisit it and create an opportunity for students not to get the same content over and over again, but to adapt to the examples and changes that are persistent in the students' lives and in the, in the environment life as well? These teachers also believe that all students can succeed. That's a key argument here with the, with the pedagogy. These are teachers who are saying, I see this African-American child and I inherently believe that they will be successful and that they can learn and, they, and that they belong here. Because that messaging and that mindset reverberate into the classroom environment, when a teacher stands in front of the room, students could feel that. Yes? And I would say at that point, and believing that they can succeed above average. That, I like that. That's true. That's right. Thank you for saying that. Experiences. Yes. Oh, yeah, no, they're doing just fine. It's like, well, wait a minute. Mm -hmm. <laughs> just fine on, on what level? And what's the bar, right? What is the expectation? Is the expectation, I, I'm glad that you said that, they could succeed just as much as their other peers, uh, their counterparts in the environment. So it's even having a high standard of what that success looks like. Thank you. These teachers help students make connections between their community, national, and global identities and see teaching as digging knowledge out of students. So we're here today because the topic was centered around African American students. So in this conversation, there's a topic around race. So I wanted to give some information about how do we contend with this idea of a black racial, racial identity, because it is important. So this is where we transition into research that I'm very passionate about and research that I've done. So first, I want to start with this concept of identity, because we use the word quite often. And so the word identity is often used in the social sciences, but it really is the answer to that question, who am I? So we think about that as adults in different spaces that we go into, but think about young people, children, black children in particular, thinking about that question, who am I, who am I? Because at the core of that question, they're thinking about beliefs, ideals, and values that make them who they are, that make them distinct from other individuals around them in their environment. So the topic of identity is something that's really important when we're having this conversation, and it doesn't happen without this conversation around academics. More specifically, black racial identity development is a process that helps students develop their self-esteem, their sense of self-worth, and their ability to have that activated or come into fruition in the different environments that they're a part of. Their home being one of them, and I'll get into that, the classroom environment, extra co-curricular activities that they would participate in, that concept of who they are comes up in those different spaces. And why is this important? Having a black, or understanding of a black racial identity development is useful in today's society. Not only is it useful, it is a, it is a vehicle for examining beliefs that children have in regards to their race. We know here in the United States that race is a marker. Those racial social categories are prevalent just as much as other social group identities that come with that. Whether if you are not just of a particular race and being black. What does it mean to be a black male in school? What does it mean to be a black girl in school? Those two connections there are important. 
and thinking in terms of the intersectionality that this conversation is not about just the black racial identity development, it's about other forms of the kids' development, their identity that come in contact, that they come in contact with. Middle school in particular, what research argues is that that's where it's the most pronounced for students as they start to have these questions about their sense of belonging in terms of their race. It's noticeable at the elementary school level, but it's especially poignant at that moment in time when the students are making that transition into the middle school space. That is where not only they're developing their understanding of race, but they're also developing what does it mean to be an adolescent. That's when questions around what am I supposed to do with my life? Who is this? What is my family about? What are these circumstances that I experienced in my life up until now? What does all of that mean? Um, why does my teacher dress a particular way? All these type of things that a student start to observe is heightened in the adolescent years for teenagers and especially for um, black children. So African-American teenagers who have a keen sense of racial consciousness start to contend with their personal and their social identities. So that is what the research is arguing. I wanna talk about this topic of racial socialization because students don't live in a vacuum. They come from different homes. So just as much as we have the conversation about the school environment, we also have to contend with what are students learning at home. So I have this quote that I um, wrote in my dissertation study that I'll um, talk more about. This idea that parents who promote race consciousness or awareness of black culture in the home promote positive black racial identity in their children, whereas other parents who remain race neutral may inadvertently cause their children to struggle with their identity. So the messaging, whether covert or overt messages around what does it mean to be black, it does happen in the home. And that's something that's not, that we will not dismiss. It's something that I want to acknowledge and give, um, and give a voice to the way, the different ways in which parents choose to have conversations about race with their children. It, it has an impact on how they're also experiencing the um, environment. So then I get into this study that I did around black adolescent school experiences centered around racial identity development. I reflected on my, throughout my time at San Jose State University in the doctoral program, I kept going back to my experience that I shared with you all earlier, this idea of like being a young black girl from East Palo Alto and making a shift you know, going through public school and private school and navigating those two different worlds, I thought about race a lot, right? I thought about race when I took the bus from two public school, public transportation, so public buses from East Palo Alto to get over to Atherton. I paid attention to who was on the bus. They were all kids of color, majority Latino, majority, majority black and majority Pacific Islander. I paid attention to where people got off the bus and the different schools that they went to. And I paid attention to the fact that I was always the last one on the bus because my school was in a completely different neighborhood. And I paid attention when I walked from the bus station to get to the high school that I attended that I saw white people all around me in that transition walk into my classes. I was very aware of my race and what that meant for me as an individual. So my curiosity around this topic is predicated on my personal experience. So I wanna say that my study focused on independent private schools. However, I bring it up today because there are implications for public school contexts and charter schools, particularly here in the, in the Bay Area and surrounding areas where there's just a smaller population of black students. So some of the stuff that came up in my study persists in other public schools and I know that as a consultant because I'm called on a lot to work with individuals who have children and who teach in schools that are public just as much as they are charter, private, and other type of schools. So the questions that I focused on were, how do African-American black high school students attending independent schools conceptualize or think about their race and their racial identity? How does a person describe themselves in terms of their background, more or less, is what the question was about. I also wanted to know is how do those sites, as in the school environments, cultivate their understanding of race and their understanding of what it means to be black. So this was a very small study. I interviewed 12 students um, who attended 10 different schools and I did individuals, and I pretty much did individual interviews. So what my findings, what I found is that even students themselves 
define themselves not just around solely being black, but wherever students had a mixed or a multiracial identity, they also acknowledge like what their mother background is and what their father background is. All of that to say in the conversation around race, it's not a monolithic experience when you're teaching a black student. Because you could be teaching a student that has an African ancestry, literally meaning that their parents are in the United States, but they came from Ghana or Kenya or another place. You can be teaching a student that's like a domestic born individual who grew up in a black, black household here in the US. It might not seem in a, an environment where there's one child or two or three students in the classroom that any of that makes sense or it makes a difference. But for the student and how they're being socialized in the home, it does because it's a unique part of their culture and though if you put the students together in a room there are differences in terms of what they're learning and what they're going through based on their experience particularly where language is involved so even with the 12 students that i interviewed all of them weren't simply african-american students they had very diverse experiences even within the race even within being black so that was something for me to take a step back to always remind myself that I even have to educate myself on what does it mean to reach a student within a particular subgroup knowing that there are differences that exist. Another finding that I found is that within these schools, the schools took different approaches on how to handle conversations around race and how to create environments on how to bring up different content and so forth. So I wanna share some of that with you. So that second research question that I had is how does the school environment facilitate their understanding of their racial identity? There are three ways that that came about that I found in this study. There were three ways. The students talked about their cro cross racial interactions with peers, sometimes negative, sometimes positive. In any case, whenever they were interacting with their peers in the classroom, outside of the classroom, that was height helping them understand who they were. Sometimes these peers came from the same racial group. Other times the peers came from different racial groups. Sometimes they were having conversations or thinking about their race when they were interacting with international students. And other time, it was around this concept of race and class. I'm a black student in this school, but I'm from a low SES background. You're a black student in this school, but your parents are middle class. Some might have a high school education, others might have advanced degrees. Even those differences there created a space for students to take a step back to reflect on, wow, this is challenging me to think about who I am because of my interaction with this particular person. So this idea of cross-racial interactions is a way in which students are thinking about their race when they're in a school environment. Another way in which it came up, which I really want to hone in on this message later on to support you all in your work, is non-parental adult relationships. All it sim simply means is that their interactions outside of their home with people in the school environment, that could be a teacher, it could be a faculty member, a staff or a coach. These are the examples that students cited. And I want to speak to my particular experience of number four because the person on my school campus when I was in high school who made me feel most, most comfortable was a basketball coach that was African American. And every day when he saw me, he would always check in with me to say, how are you feeling today? I know this place, I know it's not a lot of us here. Hang on sister, like you're doing well. I'm so proud of you, you belong here. He was a coach. I probably would only see him for five minutes throughout the day, but that, the messages that he told me about myself and how he believed in me, it really carried me through some very difficult times. So sometimes students just see people interacting, janitorial staff, pe people in the cafeteria. You might not ever consider them playing a role in helping the students feel like they belong, but they do, depending on how they interact with the students. So those meaningful, supportive relationships with adults on campus play a role. Then the, the topic around race-based affinity groups. So my students in the study talked about a race-based affinity group. And a race-based affinity group is simply an ongoing informal meetings for individuals who share race and ethnicity in common. So the first example I would give you is think of a black student union or a Latinos Unidos. That's along the dimensions of race. However, there are other groups that can, can consist on a campus that might not really have anything to do with race. It could be around students of the LGBTQ community. It could be around students with particular learning styles. The idea is that the students who go into those spaces, they're coming together with a unifying identity in common, and that's acknowledged and recognized at the institutional level. So for the students in my study, 
all 12 of them but one had a, a, a BSU on their school campus and the student that didn't have it wanted to start one but it was something that the institutional institution in the school said this is like any other club on campus is something that's acknowledged is something that's within the um, structure of a student life program or some sort of community or group and it wasn't something that was invisible so when we talked about um, the, the, um, the feeling non-existent, a way in which schools can respond to that is creating visibility for the diversity in the groups that they want to address and not doing it off in a portable or in isolation where it's something that's not recognized at the institutional level. That sends a message. So in these particular groups, students share cultural values of black individuals. That's something that come up. Um, shared experiences of black individuals, which could be similar or very dialogue, dialogue on race-based trends, so current events and pop culture is stuff that came up and activities on race-based trends. It may be that um, a lot of students in the study, this is around when Kaepernick took a knee, that was something that they were into. They wanted to have that conversation. They felt empowered to do the same exact thing at their sporting events on campus. And they created conversations, not just within that BSU group, but also larger spaces where there was resistance or people didn't really understand why they wanted to follow that trend. But the key part is they had a safe space to unpack and talk about those particular topics before stepping out into the larger public or on their larger school campus. Does anyone have any questions about these findings? Yes. Were these public school or private school students are important. These were students at the time that were attending independent schools, but some of them, there were three that came from a public school setting beforehand. Yeah. But at the time of this study, they were all a part of a, of a private school setting. Yeah. I want to go to this quote from Lisa Delpit, because this will shape what we're going to do when we come back. I'm going to give you a break. And she argues that we do not really see through our eyes or hear through our ears, but through our beliefs. To put our beliefs on hold is to cease to exist as ourselves for a moment, and that is not easy. But it is the only way to learn what it might feel like to be someone else and the only way to start the dialogue. That's what I would ask of principals. That is what I would ask of a teacher. That's what I would ask of a counselor, any individual that's working with students is just to take a step back and really try to think about what are you hearing from this child? What are you observing? What are they saying about their experience that you might not have ever thought about? Or you might even question sometimes, is it really that big of a deal for them? I think about the example that you just gave about your child, a teacher not even knowing what, where Black History Month falls within the year and probably not even recognizing that that is a big deal for the child, whether if the child said it explicitly, but even that conversation when your you know, daughter become of age, I'm pretty sure she'll remember that conversation and even understand more what that meant, the gravity of that, that response that she received as she become older, as she starts to think about her race more. Because that does happen for children. You have these isolated experiences and the older you get, you start to take a step back and think about how it all is a buildup in terms of your racial consciousness and what you were experiencing and the schools that you were in. As an adult, I still am unpacking experiences from being in school at this stage of my life. Because sometimes I didn't have the language to name what I was experiencing, but now that I'm gaining the language, it's giving me a different lens to look at myself as an adolescent, to look at myself as a, as a, uh, um, a young child in school. So I wanna stop here to give everyone a break. Uh, you will get a seven minute break and then we'll come back and continue the work. I am going to put the information that we worked on earlier up along the walls here. All right. We're going to pick back up. So I, I um, asked you all to go around the room and just see each group's responses to the questions that we talked about earlier. Um, did anything stand out to anyone? Did anything resonate with you? Was there overlap between what your group came up with? Let's just spend a few minutes on this. I was going to say, I thought it was interesting on this one, number two, it said most are catered to, 
you know, Hispanic wealthy focus on Hispanic. So when you're, and same thing in my school district, um, mm -hmm. because we're predominantly um, Asian, when you have, which also looks off of the Black History Month, because that's usually when you know, New Year is. So <laughs> that floods over everything else. And so when you have a focus on one ethnic group, and as I think someone was saying earlier, and not the subset of that, they even tend to feel even more invisible in that environment. Thank you. Any other observations or responses to what you saw? Um, I was just on the, this one on the wall here. I was just picking up on, they put the obstacles, um, was lack of, lack of role models. Mm -hmm. um, and just trying to just dissect that, even thinking about your examples and some of the ones around the room. Um, just thinking about trying to think about quantifying that value and like whether do you have to be, and, and what kind of role model do you have to be? Right. Is it that I need to see a black person like me mm -hmm. as a role model? Like you're saying, your coach kind of like was like, hey, keep it up, girl. Or someone else as a role model, or can you be that role model? So think of it as being more flexible with the term and making sure that you can be that role model if you don't fit this criteria of being right. this person's mirror image or something like that. So. Thank you for that, because we're going to spend some time, um, the portion of the workshop around, non parental adult relationships. I'm gonna give you examples from the from students' perspective and their the examples that they give for people that would fit under a role model or adult they feel cared for, they're not all black. So you'll just hear from the students what makes that person comfortable for them. I want go ahead, yes. I was pleased to see um, in that sheet there that trauma was addressed. Okay. Because that's something we do a very, very, very poor job of addressing in our educational system. And uh, research keeps showing us that that is a major hindrance for our students, not just African Americans, mm -hmm. but more so for them. And it's just not being addressed. That's very true. And before you came here, I started with um, the book that I was reading around, Post Traumatic Slave Syndrome. And that's what the book is about. It really is about how in African American community, not just amongst adults, but even, but even with students, like that is in our in individual's consciousness and what people have experienced. But what does that look like modern day? And I saw up here around high suspicions, um, being seen as less than or not performing as high as or having expectations set lower for you. Like how does that show up in spaces where it might not be, we might not use that language to describe it, but it still is some after effects of that, if you will. I want to have you turn to your packet. I'm gonna, no, it's not a packet. It's a, a blank sheet that you have. It says page 153 on the bottom. Page 153, okay. I want to give you a little bit more information about this idea on black racial identity development. Do you need one? Okay. This is from the appendix from my dissertation study, but this is just the research on a particular topic um, over the years from 1971 up into 2008. So the original concept around um, black racial identity development theories from William Cross down to 2008. But I want to spend more time just talking about like how is it activated. So a lot of the research is around stages. Like when does someone start to think about their particular background? If you look on the handout here, the very first one, there are components to it. And that is a pre-counter, encounter, immersion, immersion, internalization, and internalization commitment. And those descriptors there provide insight on what that means for a student. So a pre-encounter, um, the research is arguing that uh, in a child or individual identifies with white culture, rejects or denies membership in black culture. Um, an encounter rejects previous identification, white culture, seeks identification with black culture. That first one there is very subtle. It's not that a student is going around uh, or individual is going around saying that I identify with this culture. It might just be like they're existing and seeing images of standards of beauty, all these subtle ways or messages that's being conveyed to them around what it means to be a person that's centered around whiteness because of the type of country that we live in. But an encounter, the research argues, is that there's a type of experience that a student have where they start to reject that and to seek to identify with the black culture, 
to start to think about different ways in which they want to represent their sh or show themselves based on their particular culture. The emergent immersion stage is completely I when an individual begins to completely identify with black culture and denigrates, denigrates white culture. And then lastly, internalization, Interna the individual internalizes black culture and trances racism and then internalizes black culture fights general cultural components. The ch challenge with stages is that as individuals, as individuals evolve, it might not be that a person is looking at this or going through this mental process in a stage. It could be that the sociocultural context that a person is, is, person is located in caused them to go between one type of experience versus another. So that is why um, this work has been expanded to look at it in like modern day times to give some language around how students could deal with their particular race. I do wanna note that everyone in the room is educators. This is around black racial identity development, but there are models around Latino identity development, Asian identity development, and students with a multi-ethnic background. So if you just do like a Google Scholar search, you'll have all these different theories that'll come up. And there are also assessments of like what individuals used to take years ago in order for them to look at the research and say, this is where a person is. I um, push back to say, again, I don't necessarily believe that it's in stages for an individual, but I do think that the language in terms of where a person is could shift depending on the context that they're in. So I wanted to highlight that a bit more. A bit more. So we talked about um, this idea here. We're gonna spend a bit of time on this non-parental adult relationship. So my next activity is actually for you to do some self-reflection. But before we do that, I wanna go over um, the art of listening and I included this in your handout as well. And this is actually for a book, from a book by Lee uh, Mong Wu around Let's Get Real. So pretty much people talking about race and Talking about race cross-culturally though, like you're in groups that are heterogeneous and you're having conversations around race with people from different walks of life. And so this is just the art of listening and I want to share some tenets of this. Listen to what is, what, what is being said and what is not. Observe the language of body. Notice how something is being expressed, what words are used. Know that what you feel isn't important as what you hear and see. Know that compassion is one of the highest forms of being present. Acknowledge and utilize the wisdom that is in each person. Acknowledge the courage and intimacy of being vulnerable. Be kind to yourself and others and notice where someone begins and ends. So my next activity is for you. I want you to think back to your experience in school and identify what were the qualities or characteristics of your favorite teacher if you had one. Maybe you didn't have a favorite teacher, but if you had a favorite adult or someone that you saw as an individual that understood you, that you could connect with, I want you to think about that. So first, I want you to write down, identify a person if someone exists for you. If not, that's also telling within itself, and we will talk about that. Write down words, phrases, or sentences that illustrate your experience. I want you to pair with people and talk about that and just think of some examples around what makes a good teacher. So if we're looking for teachers or individuals that work well with African American students, we have to reflect on our own personal experiences with our identity and concepts of what it means to be a teacher. Anyone have questions? So I wanna give you time to self-reflect and answer that question. What were the qualities or characteristics of your favorite teacher? And I am going to just pull some examples. If you hear one that resonates with you or it corresponds to what you put up there or um, maybe you didn't put it on your initial post-it but you can relate to that based on your experience with your teacher or adult, um, feel free to chime in and add insight. But I just want to pull from this list and just go over some characteristics and qualities for you all individually that makes a teacher um, your favorite. Um, so I have two here that funny, like that humor. You saw that as a characteristic, okay. Oop. Share their own culture or interest somehow. That resonate with anyone? 
went out of their way for me somehow. Inclusive. We use this word inclusive a lot. What does this word mean to anyone in the room? And a teacher. What makes a teacher inclusive? Um, so I wrote that. <laughs> so I'll just, uh, in my perspective, um, Mr. McKenna made me feel like I belonged mm -hmm. because that was a time in life where, like yourself, transitioned from, you know, uh, two different school environments. Mm -hmm. I went from public to private. And going into this new environment, kids there, they knew each other from <coughs> kindergarten, and here I am going into sixth grade, and, you know, it was a little bit more diverse, whereas the school that I came from, you know, I saw uh, kids who looked like me, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so uh, Mr. McKenna was the one that made me feel like I was there since I was in kindergarten and that I belonged even though, you know, I just barely got there and that's what I meant by being inclusive. Thank you for sharing your personal example. I saw another hand go up. I was gonna say, I think for me, inclusive means um, hearing and listening and respecting everything that's there. So, and especially as the teacher and the one facilitating in a classroom setting, to shut anyone out doesn't create that inclusion. So being able to open up and, and, and at least show the students, this is the environment we're gonna be in, this is the environment for how we're gonna conduct ourselves is inclusion. Thank you. Enthusiastic about the subject, animated, spirit teaching, caring, a sense of humor, knew me as an individual, took time to act, gave um, second chances to improve. Hmm. Noticed me, valued, caring, pushed. So I'm seeing a, a trend there around being noticed. accommodated my special needs that allowed me to still be me and be their student. And I would say that's inclusive too. Always gave quality feedback on my work, attended my games. Hmm. Anyone else have that experience? Where the teacher or the educator in your life was more, um, not only cared about your academic aspect, but other things you had going on as well. Mr. Wilson, demanding, strict, seldom smiled, <laughs> smiled at me frequently. <laughs> <laughs> Acceptance, understood, real, friendly, supportive, Validating, inspiring, dedicated, honest, interested, encouraging, consistent, warm, and demanding, a good listener, knowledgeable, did not feel sorry for me, caring, sense of humor, held high expectations for me. Can we spend some time on the, the experience of working with the teacher that has high expectations for you? I see some head nods. Does anyone have an experience or just thoughts on that particular aspect of what it means? I think um, for me anyway, and this is also the same way I raise my children, is you have to have an expectation. Because if you don't have an expectation, then there's nothing to reach for, to grow with, and to, to challenge them to strive for. Um, obviously you don't want it to be too far without you know, limits and boundaries and reach, but I think when you're learning and you're growing, you want someone that's going, okay, that's great, you did this, I bet you could do this, why don't we try this? Mm -hmm. and, and that extra support with that extra push makes the difference. It makes a difference knowing that you have the support to get there and the person that says, hey, I know you can get there. I, I expect you to get there, I know you can do it. Um, so it's the balance. It's the balance of that expectation of you can do this and you can be great, and guess what, I'm here to help you do it. 
Thank you. Yes. I don't know where this quote comes from or where, when I heard it, but it was a long time ago. Children live on cheap expectations. So when I'm working with pre service teachers, you know, expect the best and you'll likely get the best. Mm -hmm. yeah. So if without them, there's no boundary. They don't know what to do if we don't set the expectations. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, as a uh, 20 year principal, uh, I experienced a lot of what in Spanish we call the pobrecito syndrome, where um, I would see teachers have this expectation of, of allowing students to have success, right? And so success, at whatever level, they would succumb to that because, oh, pobrecitos, they, 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 only, they don't have parents, they're being raised by their grandma, or uh, pobrecitos, they, um, you know, um, their parents are going through a divorce or what have you, you know, so it's okay that you got to that point. Instead of um, having a bar where it's okay to experience failure at the beginning level, right? I love the acronym first attempt at learning, right? Um, it's okay to teach students about perseverance and, and the how at first you don't get it. You can still get it by going, by learning from those experiences, right? So. That was always my big, biggest pet peeve that pobrecito syndrome when I would see that in the classroom. And um, um, yeah, just like you said, the <coughs> expectation that will reach you if you hold fast to that is high bar. Where do we think that tendency come from? For educators sometimes or teachers to almost like it's a, a sense of pity yeah. when you see students strugg struggling immensely. Because research shows us, especially for kids of color, that they're very resilient. Yeah, yeah. so that was my, that you just read off of that, didn't feel sorry for me. Mm -hmm. The pobrecito thing yeah. totally yeah. got me that. Uh, and I think it was because um, uh, I was in, I went private school to public, okay, I did the reverse of you guys. So when I was in private school, um, my mother died when I was 10 years old. So the whole, I don't know if that really affected the expectations that they had remaining for me in private school, but once I got into public school, it was like they didn't know anything about my background, and it was like a, a start for a new career for me or whatever. And I had done well in private school, but I'm just saying, when I went to public school, it was a totally different environment, uh, much more diverse. Um, um, and it was all of a sudden like, you know, where did this kid come from? Um, my ninth grade English teacher basically kicked me out of class for good reason, for what she thought was a good reason. You already have what you need here. You may go for the entire year to the library, pick out whatever book you want, read it, and then come back and write, write a book report or whatever for me to talk about the book with me. Mm -hmm. That was my ninth grade English year. Mm -hmm. um, so it was, it was, all of a sudden, there was a group of people who didn't feel sorry for me saw potential in me and pushed me into, um, you know, I went to Alley Unified and I was one of two students in AP classes and I'm old, I'm in my 60s. So they had, and people go, they had AP back then? Yes, they did. <laughs> and, um, and so it was that idea of there were people who were there that would, you know, push me and push me and everything like that. Whereas before, I think because they knew a lot about my background and felt sorry for me, they weren't going to push me. So that, that was my experience. And it was like a total turnaround for me once I hit public education in terms of people saying, wow, and identifying me as saying this is someone who can go far. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. I'm so glad this topic came up. And there's research around it too, around deficit thinking that our teachers sometimes they have, when they look at those experiences, particularly where there are unfortunate circumstances or things that transpire in a child's life, Sometimes there is a tendency to inadvertently pity or think that the student um, cannot get past that. Whereas those opportunities could also be viewed as an asset in terms of the students developing and overcoming obstacles and how that could be emblematic of obstacles to come in the future as well. So there is definitely some further discussion that could even happen around that deficit thinking and perspective that that needs to be debunked and addressed too when we have conversations around achievement for African-American students. 
I want to spend some more time on this topic of, um, of non-parental adults. So I, I want to go back to the research findings and what came out of my res the responses or the interviews that I had with students. And it is my hope that this information could inform conversations you'll have in your district or in your spaces or just different ways that you could look at how to support educators in working with students. So I go back to this idea of a non-parental adult. So it's pretty much individuals with whom students feel they have a close connection. So some of you came up with examples from your personal life. Um, students also spoke specifically about positive student-teacher relationships. And so this fostered the construction of po a positive classroom climate, contributing to a children's academic attitudes and academic motivation as African-American students. So it was just something that the teacher did to make the student feel like that was an environment where they could thrive as an African-American. And I'll give you some examples of that. Other meaningful relationships. So there were other adult students talked about. So adults who recognize the role of race, ethnicity, and other identities play in adolescent girls. Girls of color lives contribute positively positively to youth's racial and ethnic identities, helping them to sustain their culture, values, and beliefs. So what might that look like? Well, an adult that you can go to and talk about experience you have around your hair and what does that mean for you, the clothes that you can wear, all those type of experiences that are important in the mind of an adolescent child and even an elementary school child to where you want to talk about that with an adult or someone that you trust. Well, adults who have the ability to not be colorblind and see race and talk about race and empathize with students, whether if they've been through it or not, that's a huge asset. And that's huge in terms of a meaningful relationship that a student would have to where they would want to go back to that individual and talk about stuff that comes up. I think about what it feels like to be a student in the school where you're not a part of the majority at the high school level and stuff start to come up that, that's paramount in the life of a high school student, like dance and prom and so forth. I know from my personal experience as a black girl in, in high school, I wasn't axed out on dances. Well, that was a part of the social experience of being a girl in that space, and I wanted to be a part of that, but it didn't happen that way for me. But to have someone on campus to talk about what it felt like year after year when those dances came up, to not really truly be included amongst the social crowd, that was helpful. It was really helpful because that individual was able to say, go with your girlfriends. There are other people that you might not be aware of who are feeling the same way. I'm gonna bring you all together and you could go together as a group. We need people in schools to be there for students because when you're having emotions or you're dealing with your background, you might not be in a space where you could come up with alternatives for yourself or think about different ways that you could have a better experience. It takes an adult to help you think outside of the box to troubleshoot how to make your environment better for you. And to me, that's a reflection when there are adults that um, are in an environment that could do that. It reflects well on, at the school level and the institutional level in terms of them being able to hire and identify people that bring that to strengthen the, the school community. Why does all this matter? Black students contend with their identity in schools where there is a disproportionate representation of African American and other students of color. My work and what interests me is really around spaces where there just aren't a lot of African-American students and what that experience does for the few students that are in the classroom and what that means in terms of honest, honest dialogue and conversations that need to happen with parents and those students to make sure that they're not being left behind, that they're not feeling isolated, and that they're not lonely. So the experience of being a kid is you're out on the playground, you're, like I said, you're invited, you're having this social experience just as much as you have the academic experience, and how do you support students where they're not a part of the majority? Any questions about this? That's what a lot of our scholars shared with us in the Oh, wow. Do you mind sharing any no, example they, that stood out? Or? Yeah, they just... Uh, and, and especially in um, in the city of Seaside, where mm -hmm. um, historically it was a predominantly predominantly African American community, wow. but it's not anymore. Mm -hmm. Yet the identity there's like still grasping onto that, mm -hmm. and so mm -hmm. just the outside community being brought into the schools uh, that's just a whole um, it, it's at play 
every second of that student's life. You know? So, um, you know, I did, just when we started hearing that, I mean, it, it was hard not to get emotional mm -hmm. um, hearing that perspective. You know? So, you know, what you're saying is so relevant to um, to our students that are so such a small group in. in in a predominantly uh, different uh, ethnic uh, majority um, student makeup of those schools. So and that's just so real for our students. And the fact that you created that space would just open up the door for more conversations like that to happen. Yeah. They're going to want to hear from you, so. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we will, yeah. <laughs> I wanted you all to hear from students themselves. So I will send a copy of this study because there are so many quotes, but I put out some that like resonated with me and just I'm never going to forget some of the comments that students talked about. So um, I'll have you, have you read it on your own independently first and then I'll read it. So this is from an African American female research participant referring to an um, adult on campus. This seems like a basic quote, but because I interviewed this student, I knew more about her background. So we talked about that experience of like being in an environment where there aren't very many um, students of color. This was a child that was suicidal. And this individual that she talked about, this he wasn't a teacher, he was like a coordinator of a program, really helped her overcome that experience of wanting to transition out of the school and also seeking help because she really was struggling mentally with a lot of the experiences that she was having. So she talked about, well, I'll read it. He's been through a lot in his childhood and his adulthood still to this day. And so we all trust him with everything, mainly because he's African, African American. So it's someone you can go to and talk to about anything and he'll give you advice. So I trust him a lot with a I trust him with a lot of things I tell him, so that's one person that I would say. She talked about this person being vulnerable with her, about his challenges as a male of color as well, which created a sense of um, trust between the two of them to where she could open up and share something that was that difficult that she was going through. So I think a takeaway for this, for me, is that we're adults and we're around students all the time, and sometimes they wanna know, like, what are our stories? Like, what are some things that we've been through? How did we overcome them? And I think it's important for young people to know that they have access to us in that way, because if they see us dressed up and we stand in front of them in these roles and titles, it could feel really intimidating. So wherever there are opportunities to take a step back and just remind them, before I came here today, before you saw me here today, here's some things I experienced along with my journey. That's really helpful for young people to know that about us as individuals. I have another example, and I'll give you time to read this one. This is from an African-American male research participant. So this, this one stuck out to me as well. Just whatever that teacher was doing to create that so the student could really see an English class as a place where they could do well. But taking it a step further, um, when I talked about that black racial identity development and thinking about how do you create an experience where like you're so immersed in your environment, you wanna do more than just be a student. You, you wanna take on the role of being an educator and debunking stereotypes about your background through your writing. That's huge for a student in terms of like the level of engagement they would have with the teacher to where they would take that on and feel empowered to talk about topics that are real that impact them and even brainstorming ways to combat some of the things that they would experience. So I found that one to be a really helpful one as well. Anyone have any thoughts or reactions to either um, quote? Does anything resonate with you or the experiences that you've worked with, the, the students' experiences that you've worked with? 
love the part where it says, I feel like my words have a meaning, mm -hmm. that there's someone who's listening to me. Anyone else? I'm thinking, I hope, I mean, they probably didn't, but share that with these individuals. So I think maybe sometimes educators forget mm -hmm. how much influence they actually have on the students that are sitting in there. The classroom. I mean, they're you know going through it. They got first period, second period, next kid coming through, but not realizing that that these connections and those things are really happening because the parent constantly doing it, and the kid's like yeah whatever. <laughs> and to have someone else be able to to touch them in that way is really important. Yes. Um, I love the fact that he feels very empowered. And his line about, I can educate some people and break down stereotypes for some of the ignorance that people have against African Americans, dot, dot, dot. Mm -hmm. um, I like the fact that in that space, he feels empowered, he feels he's seen and heard, and the fact that he is reflecting positive things because the things that are reflecting back at him mm -hmm. through society, the environment, social media, et cetera, et cetera, have been negative, and that's what I can, that's what I'm um, extracting from his quote there, and um, you know, I'm glad that his, that his teacher is able to make him feel, you know, that, that sense of, of freedom and power that he can express himself in, in such a way to educate others and shed light. Thank you. And that's where we get into that cultural, culturally relevant pedagogy. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's like um, co-creating it with your teacher. And I think that's, a, that's huge when the student could do that, to take an assignment and go and talk about it in a way that means something to them. To be able to do that with the teacher, that's, that's a, another example of how that pedagogy comes into play. So we spent a lot of time talking about the student experience, but I did want to share some research on um, different models of engaging families as well. What does that look like? Um, we talked about this conversation around black racial identity development and racial socialization, but there is research that explore what does the parent engagement look like across different grade levels for African American families in different sociocultural contexts in schools. So I will go over some of these studies. Um, this one here is around a study entitled Examining Parent Involvement and in Reversing the Underachievement of African American Students in Middle Class Schools. And this is by Howard Reynolds. So he talks about that uh, parent agency engagement and involvement are ways that a school could think about addressing topics around black students. First, the importance of being informed. He argues that the, the importance of being informed and remaining inquisitive about the happenings of the school life is what you want from a parent to be able to engage with the school. The need to question, critique, and challenge. The parents who do not question, challenge, and critique their schools and their practices and fail to advocate for their children are entrusting the fate of their children to the schools. So he's arguing that you want to think about what, as an institution, how do you create a space for parents to be able to critique and challenge the school? I'm going to say in my experience working with schools, it might not feel safe for that to happen in a public forum where administrators are in the room. It might be that parents might do that in their home or they have a safe space where parents come together moderated by a parent or another facilitator to talk about their experiences. So I just want to be realistic and say that the culture of the schools might not always invite these type of conversations to happen or make a parent even feel like they want to step foot on campus. So I think it's important to reflect on the schools that we come across, how might we support the schools to move into this direction to invite this type of engagement if it's not happening already. Uh, the need to question, critique, and challenge, sometimes it is a parent advocate that's an ally for other families that also might be a voice, even when those families aren't in the room, that probably have a, a rapport with the administrator or a teacher. That's a way in which those topics could come up as well. And the importance of collaboration, the need for space to network with other African American parents, particularly where there's underrepresentation. 
in schools. So I mentioned earlier this idea of these race-based affinity groups, BSUs and so forth, um, that also could exist at the parent level and at the district level. So this is a book on how to facilitate that process. So in this book, Adrian Dixon argues that schools themselves have a responsibility to assure that systems are in place that invite parent engagement. And I really wanted to just juxtapose the two because if we have the conversation around parent engagement, the onus, the conversation in a narrative for so long is that the onus is on the family, is always on the family. Though there is some truth in that some parents will come forward, we have to talk about is, are these environments safe for parents to be able to do that? So how do you engage parents? So in this book, she argues that there are four strategies that facilitate parent engagement. And we could look at this cross-culturally for different type of groups. Face-to-face um, -face communications among parents, teachers, and other community members. The examples of that are parent-teacher um, parent conferences, coffee meetups with administration, administration just because, those type of events to engage families. Any type of event outside of after school hours or families will come together and connect with others, create face-to-face -face communication as well. Newsletters, emails only go so far, but being in the same space with people help break down barriers and create a sense of safety for parents. Um, parent activities that appeal to the individual needs and interests of all groups. I really wanna focus on this particular topic. I don't know if I mentioned this earlier, but I did teach, I, when I mentioned the Citizen Schools program that was in East Palo Alto at Cesar Chavez Academy um, for the extended day program. And one of the discussions we would always have as educators is what do we do in an environment where there's a small population of African American families we have Pacific Islander population, but we also had Latino Hispanic families. So the primary language for many of the children were Spanish. So if we're having an event where there are over 100 or 200 people in the room, how do we manage Spanish translation? Because we couldn't deny the opportunity for Spanish, Spanish speaking families to be a part of the school, but we also will receive feedback sometimes that there had to be a balance because the program ends up being longer so do you separate people? Do you have the same meeting multiple times? What does that mean for the administration? Administration. So I bring that up to say that there are nuances in our schools where we're accounting for the different languages that, that parents speak, that, that parents and their children speak. And then we're also trying to factor in how to include people who are not a part of the, of the majority. It's thinking about creative ways to engage them outside sometimes out of, out of um, all school events. All school events might not be enough for some families. So um, a culture of a healthy, positive, warm environment in which parents feel welcome, at least an opportunity per month for parents to get acquainted with the school. So I'm a huge proponent of those race-based affinity groups in addition to things that already work well on a larger school level because there is a possibility that you can miss certain populations of people. Any questions about this one? And I will say in terms of parent engagement, this is the one that I've seen schools wrestle with the most. Identifying the resources, building the capacity of teachers, because all of this stuff requires calling on people in your environment to show up and be there after hours, five, six o'clock and so forth. Like it's a lot of work, but how far will a school go to engage communities or communities of people that are not being reached? There's a lot to consider. And a way to circumvent that is building up, I believe with the parent community, is building up the leadership of your parent community and providing recognition for parents who do have the bandwidth to help be a part of these spaces and providing funding and space for it to happen. And if there are teachers who are gonna be a part of that, thinking about how do you support them or give them credit or recognition for the extra work that they do. Because in spaces where there are underrepresented black students, if in the chance that there is another person of color, the work tends to fall on them and they tend to take on more responsibility than other groups would to support the students. So I just wanted to see, I mean, explain that I've seen that happen too. So we wanna recognize burnt out can exist especially when the students and the family identify a person as like a great ally, who, and that ally could be an ally for so many other families and students. How do you support them and make sure they're not being burnt out? Questions? Yes. I'm 
kind of question with a comment. Um, I just, um, you know, culture will always eat structure for lunch, you know, so just, I, I can see why you're saying that the research states that um, most schools do grapple with this, but uh, yeah, it just, to me, it's just like leadership level. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, we got to work on the culture first, and then the structure will happen. Um, I, I always, you know, press this amongst um, my teachers in the sense that um, whenever you have the opportunity to meet or converse with a parent, I always start with something positive. Because this is like putting money in the back, right? Because whenever you meet that parent, and if it's supposed to be a symbiotic relationship, right, um, you know, um, make take advantage of those opportunities to connect with parents. So, yeah, it's just, it's just you're, you're preaching to me, so. I, I, I don't know. This makes me want to go back to the school set. <laughs> <laughs> you said it was 20 years as a principal? Yes. Wow. High school, middle school, and elementary school. Wow. You know every single context. <laughs> yeah, actually, I started at the high school level for 10 years, and I was, was afraid to go to elementary school. <laughs> but when I got to elementary school, I died and went to heaven. <laughs> <laughs> That's an old I think it also. else. Race based affinity groups. This came up earlier. Um, this is at the student level, Black Student Union. But that's high school, right? So what does this mean for a middle school? Well, middle school you might find a cultural group like this. But the question is, what does this mean at the elementary school level? Because there's discussion around that. Are elementary school students too young to be put into a group like this? What do you all think about that? How do you have conversations around race? And do you, in your experience or what you know, feel that elementary school level is an appropriate level to have a race-based type affinity group? So before you answer the question with me, just turn to the person or the people at your table and just talk about that for a minute. Race-based affinity groups at the elementary school level. <laughs> so I want to bring it back in around this. I, um, before you started talking, I posed that question is, how early do we start to think about these type of groups and acknowledgments and differentiate students based on their race and give them these spaces? So I wanted to know in your experience, um, what are your thoughts on the elementary school level? Anyone want to share? I just shared with the group here that my grandson is in the he's in fifth grade, and his teacher did know the Black History Month class. <laughs> and they were studying, and he asked me, Grandma, do you know who Harriet Tubman is? And I said, yeah, I do know who she is. And he wanted to watch the movie. Um, with me, and he said, but it's our red. I said, well, I think it'll be okay. I said, it'll be okay. I was like, yeah, you know. And he, he said to me, as, he, asked, he was asking a lot of questions, but he said, did those actors really have to say the N-word? Mm. And he said, I feel sorry for that. I got goosebumps, you know, because his awareness of how powerful, you know, and how denigrating that that is was but it was a really good experience because he asked a, a lot of questions and I am one that if you say hey, anything biased in my car, you have to get out and walk. I'll let you out right here. I was driving to Sacramento the other day and somebody made a generalization about a group and they said, that was really racist. <laughs> <laughs> so they know around me that they have to, you know, be very careful. But I was, I think it should start at birth. You know, you start talking. And preschoolers, having worked with preschoolers most of my professional life, they are very sensitive to differences. And that's the time to start talking about it and thinking about it. I don't know if any of you saw Hair Love. You mm -hmm. seen her? That's yeah, it's yeah. the yeah. one in Academy Award. Yeah. Uh, that was amazing. Yeah. 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 yeah, but I think that something like that for kids to introduce them to something like that at an early age is really affirming. Right, and right. developmentally appropriate. Mm -hmm. Yes. That, right? Yes. yes. Yeah, 
Although I would say that that would work for a middle schooler and a high schooler too. Absolutely. That one. Yeah. I think that was our conversation at this table was they're aware of it anyway. Like, mm -hmm. you know, to, to your point, her grandson came to her and That's said, right. hey, so for us to, to put blinders on like, mm -hmm. like they don't know yet is it's ridiculous because they do. Yeah, that's what we talk about too. Like the experiences don't just happen when you become a teenager. Like they, it's not like oh well you're you're twelve, you're middle school age, you're twelve, so you know it's okay. To talk about these or these experiences are now real. They happen from the get go, and and you you do a huge disservice if you're not acknowledging that they happen, let alone creating the spaces to. <coughs> educate around and, and um, own the truth, right? right. Like, you perpetuate if you're not going to say, nope, this, here's your protected space and time. So, thank you. So my stance on it is that it's never too early. The most important things in schools is training your teachers t to do this work like preparing educators and giving them the support and the scaffolding that they need to be able to support students in these conversations and have these type of groups um, if they want to have them in the school, if the school supports them. And that's bringing in facilitators, it's having them read stuff, but this idea of uh, I, what I'm learning through this work is that just as I need to in the classroom with the students that I teach, like walk them through like this is why we're learning what we're learning, here's where we're going to go, teachers need it too. Like so hands on to the point where um, I had a client that I was working with in a San Mateo area and their focus around like their um, service learning was around ableism. And so before they sent the students off to go work with individuals with different learning needs, they wanted them to have the language, address their biases and do some education around that. But before the students needed to, the students could learn that, they wanted the teachers to learn that. So in doing the training and the preparation with teachers, I even wrote scripts, like here's the, the packet on like how to facilitate the conversation. And some students, some teachers needed a step further to say, but almost like, what do I say? Which is, which is interesting and telling, right? But uh, because oftentimes people are within their academic discipline, they're in their discipline. You're teaching math or you're teaching science or you're teaching something in the humanities, but the social justice education is something that's like prevalent right now and it's what's needed to move the schools forward. So thinking of that as a discipline within itself and preparing teachers to tackle it and teach it outside of their discipline takes a lot of work, but it's well worth it and teachers are well capable of doing it, but they deserve to have some support, then be handed something or just told they simply have to do it. Um, they need the support in order to get there is what I'm learning. Is your hand going up? I saw it coming up. <laughs> We decided to address it via um, what we call book clubs. Okay. And then the BSUs are later, but okay. book clubs first. Okay. Uh, taught by, well, it's African American kids, taught by an African American, and based upon books that were selected, you know, by uh, the teacher and by the presenters, or the readers, we call them readers, mm -hmm. that address the issues that are pertinent to the students in that school, in that um, class. And um, that works well. Yeah. Literature. Yep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I am, well, let, let's go back all the way to the beginning. <laughs> so our learning outcomes were to address the complexities inherent in being black in classrooms, to teach techniques and strategies for supporting educators in building meaningful and authentic relationships with black children and to practice having honest, objective, and supportive conversations to become better advocates for African American students. So we just skimmed the surface, but it is my hope that you walk away feeling that we reach these goals as an institute. So I want to end it here, but in terms of um, like what's next, this is my first introduction to being in the Santa Clara County Office of Education with this type of work. Um, ongoing conversations that happen with this. I just want to put it out there in terms of other workshops that I lead and one that's come up a lot is around how do schools respond to racial microaggressions or stereotypes or those comments and the instance, instance, insensitivities that are happening within schools, particularly around the use of the N-word. 
Um, that's happening a lot at the high school level or just racial epithets and examples of where students are feeling marginalized and their peers and be, are being insensitive and so forth. So that's like a workshop in case any of you all are interested, you'll have my contact information that I'll be leading next around how to respond to microaggressions in the school, particularly for educators to like go back into their spaces and be able to tackle and, and to work on that. If you're ever in the Santa Cruz area, I teach up in Santa Cruz, believe it or not, I commute from San Mateo to Santa Cruz twice a week, um, but I teach classes on social justice in the social sciences department. So I've been there for the past two years. I absolutely love it. And I would just say an insight for me that I'm learning that's challenging me, which is really awesome, around the conversation of social justice. I'm used to teaching like around domestic diversity and conversations around race, but because there's an international population, I'm having to go back as an instructor and think about how do I engage Chinese students in the conversation around race because their context isn't the United States. Or how do I engage a student that's coming from a completely different context, but they still need to know and learn this content in order to meet their requirements in the school. So that's where I'm at in terms of like these type of conversations. When the room is truly heterogeneous, there's a national, national diversity that's a part of the room sometimes, and I'm really grappling and working on how to become better in serving that all populations of people with this type of work. So I wanted to share that. But I wanted to say thanks everyone for being here. Make sure you take a packet, you sign up. I will send the PowerPoint slides if you find them useful. Um, the references, including my work for anything, everything that I've mentioned is in this handout here. And I also just put some terminology there. If you're interested in having a longer list, I have like over 30 terms, but I only use the ones that came up today in terms of like the conversations we're, we're having. But um, terminology is huge. Right, in our spaces, we use these terms and concepts, but what do they mean and do people actually know what the expectation is behind these words? So I put that in there for you and I put that, um, the piece on how are the children doing. Um, you could find that online, but it's also in the book, which I highly recommend. So thank you all for being here. I do have a brief survey and a certificate for you all. <laughs> this is from the office here, because this was three hours of professional development. <laughs> so. Oh, thank you all for being here.